Okay. Good evening. Thanks for coming tonight. A couple of quick announcements before we get started. Um, first of all, I'm just going to have everyone, if you could turn your cell phones to silent, just so it doesn't disrupt the speaker or anybody else once we get started. When you all came in, you received a blue survey. If anyone doesn't have it, we have some people walking around. They can give you one. So if you didn't receive a survey, you can raise your hand. I can have someone bring one over to you. Thank you. We'll be sure to get them. If you could please fill those surveys out. We read each and every one of them. And that's what helps us to pick the, other, the speakers and the topics and to know that we're doing a good job. So please be sure to fill all of those out. And just as a reminder for our annual conference will be taking place on November 12th at the Convention Center. Our website is being updated, so check that at the end of this week and we see the topics that are on there. There's going to be someone talking about pain, someone talking about technology, of course, someone talking about research, so it should be a, a great event. And our next lecture will be taking place on Wednesday, July 20th, so save the date for that. And that will be on fair housing and accessibility. So before we get started with tonight's speaker, uh, when it, this, these are about research, and whenever we come, we ask you to participate in your research projects. You hear from us a lot. We completed one of our research projects on Care Call, and we wanted to give you an update on what we found for our results. So Beth Lynn Houlihan is the um, assistant director of the New England Regional Spinal Cord Injury Center, and she's just going to give you a quick five to ten minute update on what those results saw. Hello, everybody. How are you? Be sure to take a cookie or a brownie. They're really good. That's my tip for the night, <laughs> for those of you that are here with us in person. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to give you some, a very brief overview of um, some great, um, uh, great project that we just did that was really trying to um, help bridge the gap between short lengths of stay and um, people ending up back in the community and really try to um, fill a service need. And hopefully, we'll see that we're helping out. The reason we're doing it tonight is because tonight we're talking about pressure ulcers. And one of the things that we were trying to help was to prevent and reduce the severity of pressure ulcers. So let me go very quickly for you all. So what we were trying to do was, was look at getting uh, pressure ulcers and depression in particular because they're still su such important secondary conditions for people that are living with spinal cord injury. And um, as I was just saying about lengths of stay, as they go down, it's bec there becomes an even bigger gap for people. And even longer out from injury, they just found there was just a model system study that showed that people that um, there's a pressure ulcer incidence is increasing both for people that are less than a year injured and people that are 15 plus years post injury. Because as people start to age with their injury, their bodies change and things happen that you don't expect to happen as your body's changing on you. <laughs> and things you were doing were working for you, and then they're not anymore. So um, this is a big thing that we're trying to, to address, and is, is there are not many resources out there to be able to get services to people and help them. We were trying to come up with some way that we could help to fill that gap that wouldn't require a lot of resources, but could actually make a difference for people. So that's what we were trying to do with um, this study that we're call, called Care Call. And it is about caring. You'll see. <laughs> so what we were hoping to do was reduce the incidence and the severity of pressure ulcers, reduce the severity of depression, and we we're trying to get be people be better access. To, ooh, that's louder. Better access to appropriate health care and improve community integration. So that's what all the things that we're trying to do. And community integration was really reducing the, the barriers that keep you from being able to get out and do what you want to do. So that was one of the things we were trying to do too. And people ended up getting calls. Their care call would dial out to people, and it's a computer-controlled telephone call. So it's a it's a, a call that will it will call you, and it has a digitized voice, and it would try to call people every week, and they could also call in 24/7 if they wanted to to get do their weekly call to do this nice relaxation exercise that we had for everyone that they liked a lot um, to tell us if they had a new skin problem or to leave a message for a nurse health coordinator, which was the other piece of this that was really important. We wanted to have something that was 
automated that might be able to really um, make a difference for people as an automated system, but then ha we had a nurse so that if there was something that just wasn't getting caught or you were just not working for you with the way that the, the system was, was talking to people and, and working with you, then the nurse would step in and you could leave a message and the nurse would get back to you and work with you and really try to help you get where you needed to be. So those were the two pieces of it. And we tried to make sure that um, all the information, it had a lot of different pieces to it, and we wanted to make sure that we didn't put too much in any one call, so they weren't too long. So we staggered all the information so no one got overloaded in any one call. But they were all in the study for six months, so it was a long time to be doing a weekly call. So we had alerts to the nurse, and the way that worked is we'd have a routine alert that would be like 72 um, business hours before you get back to them. We had urgent alerts, and then you get back to them within 48 hours, and then emergent alerts, which were like, I have a new skin problem. And that would be also 48 hours, but we'd say, you need to go to the emergency room, because we couldn't, within our system, be able to help you on an emergency level, but she could then follow up and say, hey, did you go and get that taken care of? What do you need to do? this is what you need to do to, take, to, to, to go to the next step with it. So the nurse was gonna be right there with them and try to help them. And if someone was, um, we also had issues if people were, uh, if they had any issues of self-harm, we had a plan in place to try to help deal with that. And so this nurse telehealth coordinator, she really addressed any issues that care call couldn't for people if they just didn't feel were being taken care of. And um, so she would really, she'd get messages from people and call them back or there was an alert through care call if it identified a problem and it would um, alert the nurse and then she would, would call them and talk to them and follow up and make sure that they were okay and help them get whatever they needed. And we also had a resource book that we put together um, and that was, had a whole bunch of very comprehensive list of all sorts of resources from, for both Eastern Massachusetts and Connecticut, the two places we did the study. And um, we had people both with SCI and people with multiple sclerosis. So we had resources for both those groups and um, it was given to everyone. And we had people that either went into the intervention group that got care call, or they went into the group, the control group, that didn't get anything except what they usually do for care, but they also got the resource book. So <clears throat> it would, um, care call itself would tell people, hey, look in your resource book, find this information, this will help you. And we also had forms we created to help people with going to see their doctor before they get there, and then once they're there, so that they can help think out their appointments and get the most out of them. So the study sample, this just gives you some very basic information. We had, like I said, an intervention group and a control group. And um, they were similar, mostly similar. And that's what this just lets you know is um, one thing that's very interesting to know is that in b across both groups, there was 40 to 50% had a previous ulcer. And another um, 30 to, to 40, 33% so in the intervention group and 43% in the control group had a diagnosis of depression previously. So it's just kind of interesting to kind of get a sense of the group that we're starting with before we even did this. Whoops. So we also went back to um, look at how we, one of the things we wanted to see is do people really use care call, the ones that, that had it, which tells you whether or not they found it to be useful to them if they were actually continued to use it over the six months. And there were only 11 people out of 71 that had um, three or more calls that they missed, that it would tell us if they missed them. So they were considered non-adherent, like they really didn't use it, they didn't like it. So that's pretty good. And then um, there were a lot of people that ended up ca calling in, and they didn't have to call in. Uh, it would dial out connected means that it would call you every week. So dial out connected means that it was able to contact someone, and dial in means that people called in, and that means that they, they must have had something that was useful enough for them to motivate them to want to call in. And one of the things that was most interesting that I just really wanted to get to show you was that um, we started out baseline prevalence, which means before we even started the study, uh, you can see that between men and women, there were certain levels, intervention control, there were similar, similar um, amounts of pressure ulcers. When you get to um, the end of the study, we have care calls impact on pressure ulcers, which is right here. You'll see that for women, there were no ulcers at the end of the study. So at the beginning of the study, in the, the blue group, there were 19% had ulcers and then none, which what you call that significant. It was actually, we, the, our results showed that was because of care call. And for men, 
there was no difference <laughs> from one to the other. So Care Call helped women, but it didn't help men for some reason. <laughs> so it's, it's great that it worked, and we're just very interested to try to understand why it might not have helped men. So we're going to look at other things like, did they go on the calls? Were they actually using the system? What else might they have been doing? Did they start at a point that was lower where they were doing less than um, skin care for themselves than the women wore, or what? So we're really trying to figure out what happened, but it's cool to see people used it and it made a difference for them, apparently for mostly the women in that case. But <laughs> for depression, it also made a difference. What this shows is you'll see that the red line is the, the control group that got that nothing but standard care, and the blue line is the people that used care call. And for the people that use care call, the, the thing that this shows here is the people that were more depressed at the beginning, it, had, it helped them mo even more as they went along. That's why this line kind of bottoms out. It means they, that they got even better. Um, depending on if they were more depressed at the beginning, it helped them get even better by the end. So it helped them, um, anyone, that had, anyone that had depression, male or female. So Care Call helped both with pressure ulcers and it helped with depression. So we're very excited to see that it actually made a difference for people. Um, and the other thing is people felt that healthcare was more available to them. And people rated the calls, and on a scale of one to five, it had an average of almost four, and the, the mode uh, was five, and the median was four, which means the mode is like the most number of responses were five, and um, the, or the other way around, I always confuse them. <laughs> so I'm just gonna say that, there, <laughs> that um, people seem to really like it. And then um, you can see some good, some bad. And the participant feedback we got was very useful to us too. People that rated it said, I want to thank you. It's very entertaining and very useful to me. I appreciate everything you guys have been doing for me. I really enjoy this call once a week. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time. And the other one, I want to thank you for this terrific phone messaging you have here. It's been extremely important for me to listen and pay attention to my skin. It's a big deal for me. I'm having poor circulation in my feet. It's what I've been having trouble with. I'm staying ahead of the game right now. I want to thank you again for all the information you've given me. <clears throat> So we're going to do a, a next try to really, this was a smaller group in just one part of the country. We need to have a lot more people to be able to really show that it works so that it will convince people around the country that this is something that they should use and put into practice and actually use as a part of their clinical practice. Until we do it with a larger group and we do it across the country, we don't have enough people to do the kinds of things that we need to look at um, and to make sure that it's going to work across the board for people. So um, that's the next thing we're going to do with it. And we're just very excited to be able to hopefully come up with something that could make a difference for people and help them to uh, live the lives they want to live and keep healthy. So that's what we're hoping for. And that's it. <laughs> well, the next time around, we'll be calling you. Don't you worry. <laughs> and in the back, I have um, an article that we wrote for the, how we developed it. It tells you all about Care Call, and it tells you about um, how we developed it. We did all sorts of testing with people first to make sure that it was okay for them, and it tells you a lot more about how it's designed, and um, it's, all, it's in the back of the room at that table in the back if you wanted to pick that up, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. I have to leave early tonight to go back to my infant, but um, I would, by, via email or any other way, my email is on the article as well. I'd be most happy to talk with you at any point about any of that. So that's all I have to say. Um, any other questions before I introduce the speaker? All right, great. Thank you. <laughs> That's nice of you. <laughs> I, as you can tell, I was trying to go super fast so that we can get to the, to the main meat of the show, if that's a saying. Here we go. So um, I am just going to introduce our speaker, Lauren Harney. She works here at Boston Medical Center. She's a, a wound ostomy nurse. And she's held board certification as a wound ostomy nurse for 12 years and has extensive experience in skin care for acute and chronically Ill, Ill individuals. In her career, she has worked in various settings ranging from urban community care to level one trauma hospitals. Ms. Harney helps to establish guidelines and wound care formularies in various healthcare settings, and she serves as a consultant advising physicians and rehabilitation staff in developing best practices for wound ostomy care. And I don't know Lauren very well, but just from some anecdotal uh, conversations I've heard, she's kind of funny too. So I think you're going to enjoy <laughs> her presentation and, and all of her knowledge tonight. And we're so glad that you're here to be with us. So thank you very much. And Lauren's going to come up now. And thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Bethany. 
Geez, that is just an awesome study that you're doing. I think it's wonderful. Oh, it really okay. is. I'd like to learn more about it. Oh, I'd be happy you know, it'd be great. So thank you, thank you for um, inviting me here. And I'll be doing this quite a bit, okay? So just to let you know, so I don't want that to be a distraction. Um, and uh, so it, it's really a pleasure and an honor for me to do this. And I uh, am just excited to actually have all of the people from Seven West here because they do such an awesome job. You have no idea. And just coming from the community, uh, from where I used to see the battles that or the, the care uh, at, at home, which be sometimes horrific, saying, oh, that they got this at the hospital. And the knee-jerk reaction they used to get, like, well, I can't wait to get a hold of my hands of that nurse ratchet. You know, they could possibly do this to a, a patient. And um, to come to find out when I come into the hospital, saying, like, there are just so many factors that play into skin and, and how you really have to look at the person as a whole person. And I'm proud to say that the, the, the care at, at Boston Medical is just phenomenal. So with that, um, let me just start with uh, these objectives here. And I'm going to try to go as fast as Bethany. I have a lot of slides. And the reason why I have a lot of slides is that that, that videographer doesn't you know, show my face so much. So uh, for you, hello out there. And uh, thank you for, for uh, tuning in, so to speak. And Mr. Director, am I looking OK? And does this podium make me look bad? I hope not. So OK, let's go with this. All right. So. Um, the objectives here are very, very simple. They're just to identify the risk factors. It's, it's simple and much, not much to say about that. The second part is probably the most important now these days where the cost containment issues and the spinal cord injury patient because of the mm -hmm. Medicare, um, the Center for Medicare Services is changing constantly and so are the reimbursement um, mm -hmm. factors are too. So um, that's part of, of uh, in the later part of my presentation that I'll speak to more of as far as reimbursement for um, your uh, mattresses and wheelchairs and even for some of the wound care products. Okay, whoops, so let's go back here. Okay, so let's take a look under uh, let, at the skin that you're in here. So this is a very simple um, generic picture of uh, the, largest, the largest organ in your body. Um, you can see it's filled with layers and structures of the skin uh, and it's very complex uh, plex, and yes, it's sturdy, but yes, it, it can be very vulnerable. So let's first start with the epidermis. Um, this is our protective coating um, that enables us to really exist in this world. It protects us from the pollution, the bacteria that we walk around in. As the skin, uh, as it starts to migrate um, through the five layers and it makes itself to the, uh, to the surface, it becomes dead, flat cell skins. Okay, and so what happens is that after being rubbed, scrubbed, and replaced with new skin cells, um, they do rejuvenate after two weeks. And this speaks to that. Sorry about the couch, but I'm shedding right now. And that's true. We do really shed. So uh, just to, that's a true, true to life there. And this can be too much shedding, uh, which leads to over dryness. And that's really a very good picture. I don't know if you uh, can see it very well, but you can see where all that rubbing on the surface is almost made like a callus or a scar tissue. Um, and that could be just from spasticity. It could be from itching. It could be from anything. All right, and the second layer is the dermis. That, that's what really makes us so sensitive, okay? It's the middle layer, and um, it's considered to be something like you would feel if you were having goosebumps. Um, and, or maybe a better explanation would be like a blister or even uh, the shaving uh, of the nubs there. Okay, and that's a pretty good picture of a blister right there. And actually, it's about, although that looks like cardboard, it really is the, between the epidermis and the dermis, it is about as, as thick as, as cardboard. Okay, then we go down to the subcutaneous, and this is where you kind of pinch an inch, all right? So this is what it's all about, that subcutaneous, uh, where you look really closely at the vessels there and the interlocking layers. This is what controls the body's temperature, and it helps eliminate the waste products, okay? This is a, a really good picture of what the uh, subcutaneous is, um, a bruise. A bruise is a very good description of that. You can see the coloration in there, and that's actually blo uh, broken uh, vessels in your skin that's, that has risen to the surface. Usually with a bruise like this, it can, uh, the body can reabsorb it. Um, but again, if we're looking at pressure ulcers, that, uh, that's a whole different story. But this is a good picture of really what goes on at the subcutaneous level. All right, so it's all about the skin you're in. And your body works as a whole at H, a W-H-O-L-E, not a, the other one, um, but uh, as your skin especially depends on the viability and, um, 
and how your body works in sync. All right. Anyways, um, this is a great picture. This is really is what I liked about it was the fact that um, it showed the level of injury as it relates to skin. As you can see, and I don't know if this pointer is working too well, but um, can you see it? You can. Here you go. All right. So you can see with the level of injury as it relates to the skin. So. Um, and it, you have to think about not only the pressure, but you have to think about the moisture. For example, the, um, the autotomic, the hyper excitability or the spasticity. And you really should pay attention to, uh, to these types of injuries and where they could, the moisture and the problems could be. So I thought that was a great picture. All right, so um, in a spinal cord injured patient, interruption of these nerve pathways causes uh, changes in um, the sensations. And it's, it's significant, okay? The pressure, the sharpness, hot or cold, are felt differently or not at all. Um, the spasticity creates a shearing damage of the skin. You can just imagine just that spasm that's going back and forth against some sheets or against your wheelchair, uh, clothing. Um, and also the gradual sliding of the gravity and the wrinkling of the skin underneath your clothing and whatnot. Okay, so. Uh, and so it's also the lack of dermatomes. I thought that the dermatomes mm -hmm. it, I have yet to become an alternative rock band, but, um, but I thought, you know, that was interesting. The dermatomes are very, if you think about it, you know, they're very sensitive. And, uh, and it's all about really the sensitivity and what's the lack of the sensitivity, all right? It's the sweating component of it, and it's the sweating, again, the sweating, the shearing, and the friction. I can't say enough about that that really causes a problem with skin. Again, let's look at the uh, autonomic uh, hyperexcitability, the abnormal increase in the sweating above the injury site, and often the upper torso and the face. Okay, so you don't even know what's going on really if you can't feel it, okay? Um, all right, so what's below the injured skin uh, is not the same as what's above it, okay? So look at what's going on below the skin. When, uh, for a spinal cord injured patient, this is what happens. They have decreased amino acid concentration. That's a protein. That's the building blocks that, blocks that you need for skin. It decreases the proportion of the type 1 and type 2 collagen. That is the collagen. Collagen is the, the product that you need to knit those damaged tissues or it's skin in general together, okay? You have the decreased blood, uh, the blood flow, the abnormal vascular reactions. Um, that frequently happen, and um, the, PA, uh, the PO2 is five times less than the, uh, the in innervated skin, which is huge. I mean, that's really, really poor perfusion. And the abnormal vascular reactions, um, and the postural uh, hypotension, think of those people that are dependent and they have the swelling and the edema and whatnot. So that's a, that's a huge issue too. And that's below the skin. Okay, so the honest facts that cause the skin breakdown, and this is just the recipe uh, for the beginning of a pressure sore, okay? So you have your poor nutrition, you have your dehydration, you have the excess moisture due to sweating, bowel and bladder accidents, you have the decrease in your blood supply, your excessive exposure to heat, hot, um, and cold chemicals, and the excessive pressure over body, uh, over bony prominence. But you know, I know what, as Popeye says, I am what I am. So this is what you have to work with. Knowing your body shape and size can really help determine what you need. As you can see, there are many types of shapes here and sizes that can affect the, or the pressure on the skin. There's been a lot, a lot of research about how much, uh, how much uh, time can cause the skin um, changes and how much pressure really it takes to cause an injury. And they keep fluctuating anywhere between 30 millimeters uh, pressure and 50. Um, 30 seems to be the golden standard that a lot of people are agreeing on right now. And honestly, if you take a look at all these body parts, uh, body, uh, body shapes, um, no matter what you see here, it really only takes about 20 minutes for a pressure ulcer to start to develop. So that's kind of significant too. All right, so it's weight and it's duration. All right, so the incidence of skin breakdown in a, on a SEI patient, which I thought it was interesting what Bethany said because she says that women at the end of their, their, uh, their survey there, they didn't have any pressure ulcers and look at these incidents. They haven't changed much at all. Um, there's 80% in males and 20% in females. That's really high for males, again. And that's, a, um, that's really the difference. And there's a lot of uh, a question as to why that is. And so there are some things that, you know, the female's pelvic structure is better fitted for weight distribution because we have birthing bodies. So they figure that's the way that the, uh, the, the pelvic area will sit properly and that is the why they really don't get as much pressure ulcers. 
Okay, so um, the interesting too thing that, that, that Bethany said too was that as we age, uh, you do, as your skin gets older, we do, it becomes thinner and it loses the elasticity. The circulation becomes sluggish and this reduces the amount of nutrients that we need. So that's also a big factor. All right, so the law of gravity. Okay, it's really true. What goes up comes down. And this is, I think, a great picture that kind of describes everything that goes on uh, with uh, a spinal cord patient when they're sitting up. Um, we can't define Newton's uh, law of gravity. Uh, as a matter of fact, if we, we were able to do that, um, the only way we could do is if we were on the moon and floating around, our skin would be floating around. But here on Earth, this is the way the gravity, uh, this is how we are on Earth, and this is our gravity. And we can't help um, with gra you know, having our skin go sagging. I mean, that's, even if we were postural, if we were sitting up, eventually it goes south, right? We could all look at ourselves saying, like, there it goes, right in front of you. All right, so this is all about um, the components of what we just saw right here of uh, the gravity, the shear and friction, which is a huge issue. Um, it's the interplay of gravity and friction, uh, gravity and the friction, uh, which is not, po and it's really not possible to have shear without the friction, okay? Um, the force of gravity acts in concert, pushing down on the body, and the resistance between the surface, such as a, a bed, chair, or even clothing, um, in, and I kind of want to think of a, maybe of a sheet burn. So the two together, it's the sharing, it's the constant moving of those. What goes this way? Almost like this, okay? And it's actually pulling apart the subcutaneous in the first two layers. It's shearing it right off. Okay, so you add a little moisture to this and from uh, sweating, urine, or fecal incontinence, and, and this increases the shear and friction. Uh, even in mild to moderate moisture. But you know what was interesting, what, I, what uh, I was reading more about this, because I'm always trying to keep up on uh, latest and greatest of anything that comes out. And they still, to this, you know, from what the research says, is that um, uh, with shear and friction, um, decreases in the presence of profuse moisture of urine, but not in, 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 in fecal. So I guess if you have more sliding around, you know, then you don't have to, you're not going to get yourself injured so much, you know, except for if you're not changing, then you'll become in a rash, and that raises another issue. Okay, so pressure. Uh, pressure, really, it's very simply, it's the intensity, duration, and the tissue tolerance, which is the ability of both skin and its supporting uh, structures to endure pressure. That's very simple. So it's all about the intensity, the duration, and the tissue tolerance. So t uh, think about, again, those, those uh, different body shapes. Okay, so this is the typical setup for a great pressure ulcer right here. Um, it's, the, it's in the beginning state, and it may look like uh, at this point right now is stage one. If you were to look down here, if I can do this again, right here, okay, that might look a little bit of red to you. Okay, what, right here you have some deep pressure necrosis, and this is actually for everyone, this is the, a good slide for a deeper tissue injury that's just about to start. You can see with the mattresses, this right here, the bone coming down, okay? So, anyways. And this is a, a good uh, picture of bone over skin that can cause an ulcer. Pretty impressive, huh? All right, so the most problematic area for shearing. Now this is not a thong, all right? This is actually where your coccyx is, all right? So, uh, and, and it's a great picture because it shows, oops, sorry, it, it shows over here um, again, I can't do this pointer very well. Oops. Right there. All right, that's a very good picture of where the top of the coccyx is. And just, again, look at, remember that picture, up and down, up and down, up and down. So that is, uh, I thought was a very good picture of, um, of a shearing component over bone, over muscle, you know, as it shears right off. This is, um, this is actually from also shearing friction, but this is an, in a coccyx. This is actually in like a, an abdominal fold. You know, so a person that's morbidly obese, this is um, the wetness and the moisture that's in the fold that's causing this particular skin issue. And this is a, another picture of shear and friction. This is actually a picture of, um, of two heels that, were, uh, that came out of flip-flops um, with a patient that was in a wheelchair that had really horrific spasms. And uh, these are just calluses that are waiting to be erupted. These um, calluses have to be unroofed by podiatry. You can tell the difference between this uh, from landing on the, on the bottom of your heel versus on the back of your heel. So this is definitely from the foot being this way. Does that make sense? 
If it was this way, then it would be probably from a bed. All right. So, okay, the soreness around pressure ulcers, and really, it's a play of words, but honestly, it is a sore subject with everybody. Pressure ulcers are just negative all the way around. I mean, and you just can't get around it. Nobody likes it. It's always a blame game. It's just horrible. So uh, this is just going to be an, o uh, an overview about pressure ulcers so that you as, uh, what I'm hoping is, is that you can become more of a healthcare, uh, educated healthcare consumer, all right, and be able to speak to what's going on with your body so you can talk to your, uh, your providers and explain like, okay, this is what I need because I know I have a blank, 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 okay? So this is, um, this is just a chart uh, for reading, and we need to read this from the, right, uh, from the right to the left. It shows how skin really deteriorates. And it starts, you know, with the moisture, the exposure to cold, the low humidity, the incontinence. It goes into the skin contaminants or the poor environment or the inadequate nutrition. And then what happens, you, you're guaranteed to have a, a problem with your skin. This is, a, again, uh, another good chart um, from uh, right to left that is really shows about the lack of knowledge with pressure ulcers and the lack of preventing or even knowing the simple risk factors can really progress from um, the caregivers that being unaware, for the, the staff that you don't have to take care of the patient. Uh, the patient stay, you know, again it goes into that. So you have all that in place and the patient stays in the same position. They have the body weight that's, you know, on heels that aren't being elevated, even more so if the patient's immobile and there you go, you have a pressure injury. So. So anyway, so why so sore? Okay, this is a basic rationale behind why uh, pressure ulcer can start. This is why in the hospital we try and try and try to keep the head of the bed no higher than 30 degrees. And we elevate the heels, we have a turning schedule, um, uh, repositioning every two hours, et cetera. So as you can see, elevating uh, of the head, okay, if you have it higher than 45 degrees, again, that gravity is gonna bring it down. So the high combination of shear and stress and pressure at the buttocks in the sacral area is gonna cause maybe that, the picture that you saw, okay? And this is, for example, in your respiratory patients, okay, that are respiratory compromised. They come in with uh, pneumonia, all of a sudden, you know, they can't tolerate being uh, down, um, you know, more than 30 or uh, 30 is way too much. They can't even toler uh, tolerate being repositioned. So this is typically what happens in a respiratory situation. It's very much so what happens in a lot of our spinal cord injured patients too. So this is a great, these are great slides. The following are the great slides of, uh, by Dick Ford, who's a graphic artist that illustrates uh, for medical books. I just love these slides. I think he, he's just phenomenal. Um, graphic artist. So this is a picture of undamaged skin. Now, if you can see it uh, from, I have a lovely picture. I don't know what you guys have, but it's, I, I just think it's right here uh, where it shows like the knot. It's, you know, undamaged skin, so it's nice and pink. It's, it's really uh, flush and, you know, you get all the different layers here. And then um, this is a stage one. As you can see in the top of that, there's a little bit of redness that's uh, starting. And remember that a true stage one is when it stays right after reimpositioning off the site for 30 minutes. So in other words, if you are looking at yourself and you say, oh, it's red, okay? Reposition yourself off of that side, look at it again another 30, 45 minutes. If it goes away, then it really wasn't a stage one. If it stays red, then you're in trouble and it is a stage one, okay? So you really need to pay attention to that. And the way to do it too is, I, I'm sure you've all been taught this, but um, if it blanches, so if you have, if you, if it's red and you blanch it and it turns white, Okay, it means you're all set. If it doesn't, then you're starting to brew something. Okay? All right. So stage two here, as you can see, it starts to kind of um, blister. This is a, a really good um, picture about a blister, for a blister here. As you can see, uh, it's just a partial thickness. It's just going for the first two layers, the epidermis and the dermis. The epidermis and the dermis are able to uh, re-epithelialize on their own. I think of a suntan, you get a blister, all of a sudden it, it kind of fades away and you get a little bit of scar tissue, but it's not really super damaged, it will so, uh, soon fade, okay? So that's the difference with that. This is just stage three. And as you can see, it's getting a little bit down to that subcutaneous there. So um, although uh, there's not much, again, between the first two layers, like I said, probably about as thick as a cardboard, when you hit that subcutaneous, I mean, there's, there's a definition of it being a, a shallow for a blister, but this is, this is quite evident. You can definitely see some depth in that. And it's not through the fascia yet. 
And this is your stage four, which is the full thickness is down to tendon and bone. All right? And this is a deep tissue injury. Now, I don't know if you can see it, but I love this picture. If, it, if you guys, it's all like this great uh, necrotic, dark, um, dark stuff. I mean, it looks great. You know what I mean? You can see where it starts to brew from the bottom all the way up. And again, if you look at, just pay attention to the surface there, you know, look. If, to anybody, to the naked eye, you could look at that and you say, okay, so it's non-blanchable, so it's a stage one. All right, I need to get off of it. But what happens when you get to a deep tissue injury is that it starts to really start to evolve and it, and it progresses to an unstageable, which is like that black uh, eschar, you know, a black cap or a yellow eschar. And then from there, it goes either to a stage three or stage four. So that's what you really should pay attention to. These are quite dangerous, all right? Okay. So. I love this picture. It's another shearing injury. Um, it looks like a uh, seashell, doesn't it? As it looks right there. I love that picture. And it's and again, it has to do with the bone is trying to hold the skin in place, but the weight continues to pull the bone downward. All right, you can see where the vessels are really getting constricted there. And this is what it really looks like. That's pretty dramatic. Okay, this is pressure. Okay, and again, it's the pressure. And the bottom part of this right here, whoops, over here is this right here, the mattress. The blue flower is the mattress, all right? And um, you can see again where that bone is just really sitting right onto those vessels and really congesting uh, them. So that's a really good picture of uh, a pressure where the capillary vessels are being uh, really squished. All right, these are your pressure points. I like these pictures too. They make it really human, I think, you know? So these are your typical pressure points of the heels, the buttocks, the sacrum, hip bone, elbows, and head. And this is where your reclining pressure points again. And this is your sitting points where your shoulder blades, uh, sacrum, your buttocks, heels, and um, knees. No one uh, ever talks about the knees, but the knees are pretty important, especially if you get some spasticity back there, you can break down pretty quickly. All right, so it's time to build on your knowledge, all right? So you've got all this knowledge. Now what are you going to do with it? You're going to know everything there is to know about pressure ulcers, and now we're going to take it home, all right? So you got damaged skin. How do you fix it? You think you really fix it with a bunch of Band-Aids? I don't think so. Um, use the Band-Aids are okay to use for, for wounds when they need to, certain wounds, but you certainly can't cover it all up with all these different type of Band-Aids. Can you hear me? I don't know. If, okay. Um, but uh, when it comes to uh, preventing damaged skin, really, you just got to look at the uh, skin as a whole. All right? So take the preventative approach, all right? So promote healthy skin. Promote your healthy skin. Give it a good diet and fluid intake. Watch your hygiene. Select your proper clothing. Watch out what you're wearing there. Awareness of the temperature extremes, all right? Pressure relief strategies, weight shifts, and positioning, and manage stressors. Okay? These are all things that you just really have to pay good attention to. Again, it's the basics that get the job done. All right, let's start with nutrition. You are what you eat. That's it. Basically, you are what you eat. All right, nutrition, pay attention. You have to pay attention to your intake. The proteins, the vitamin A's, the minerals, the copper, the zinc, and irons, a minimum of two liters a day of fluid. You need to hydrate that skin. I can't, exp I can't really say much more than you need to hydrate the skin. That's the thing that's going to prevent all of this, you know, help minimize the breakdown. Think of again, think again about the dryness of the shearing and the friction, okay? Um, avoid fluids that are, act as diuretics. Again, you don't want to be sweating when you already are. So, um, and some of those are coffee, tea, and beer. So the long-term uh, nutrition needs are, uh, in fact, calcium. Okay, this can prevent uh, osteoporosis, improving muscle and nerve functioning. That's always good. Uh, it's also necessary for blood clotting, all right? Um, the fiber. Fiber, fiber, fiber. For those of you that have a constipation issue, you really should pay attention to that. Um, you, are no, you are prone to constipation, as we know, and it can be found in anything as, uh, for fruits, vegetables, and starches. The protein, um, what I like to talk about the protein, though, it's really good that you need a lot of it to help with the uh, building and uh, maintaining your skin integrity. Avoid diets that are high in protein and low in carbs, because this can also uh, cause some kidney problems. Um, yes. I'm sorry? Only if you right. <laughs> works. Oh, okay. All right. It works. I mean, you have to, like, a balance, though. Because you have a lot of fiber, so you need the water, or else you're going to be in trouble. I dropped, I dropped 50 pounds hip hop for two years. Really? Awesome. Since I've been injured, I came off, and I've lost a half month of pounds. 
Really? Since you've been injured, though? Since I was injured, the first time I was, I came off the action, most of the people found out from the surgeon, doctor, saying I should, mm -hmm. but I could not wait much more than I'd like. Yeah, it's difficult. I mean, that seems to be a problem with some, you know, the spinal cord injured patient. If they do start gaining weight, like, where is it coming from? And so, honestly, you have to look at your metabolism. You have to look at what you're eating and um, the bulk and everything else, too, the sodium that can bloat you. So there's a lot of things that you need to, t to pay attention to. So, um, and again, the too much sodium can cause uh, water retention and heart and kid uh, kidney disease and stroke. All right, so you don't have to ne always need to be a fashion statement now, really. Did you like the royal wedding? Did you love the hats or what, right? But you really don't have to be a fashion statement when it comes to dressing. You really have to pay attention. A anything that you wear, for uh, if you're in a wheelchair, you have to pay attention to those seams and those, um, just the, uh, the wrinkles and whatnot, okay? So you just have to make good choices. Dress for the weather. Wear breathable clothing like wools and cotton blends. Wear socks with your shoes. Please don't be wear. I know you can wear some flip-flops, but don't wear them all the time. Remember those heels, okay? I hope that's implanted. But, you know, that happens, okay? Avoid sitting on your seams in back pockets. Watch out where you place your cell phones. I recently had a patient that I saw out in the community that started a pressure ulcer from his cell phone, him sitting on the side of his cell phone. Okay? Too loose clothing can uh, form recalls. We, we talked about that. And too tight, over tight clothing can hinder circulation. Now, in the end of this, um, over in the, in the pile of, the, uh, of this presentation, at the back page, it has a resource where, for clothing, which I uh, looked in the, in the internet. And I saw some wonderful sites there. So you can check that out. All right, so uh, other heat and clothing tips. Okay, so avoid um, sunburn by using sunblocks. This is huge. This is huge, and I don't think a lot of people understand how huge it is. Avoid uh, just your vinyl seats before you sit on it. Try to test it, make sure, because you could burn yourself. Cold, make sure you dress warmly and prevent uh, frostbite. Dress in layers of clothing and provide uh, extra warmth. Avoid putting frozen food or bags of ice on your la laps. Don't use your lap as a cooler, and don't use your lap for a heating tray, okay? Or as a serving tray, maybe. All right, so be aware of that. And can someone please explain this, please? <laughs> I really don't get this. All right. <laughs> All right. So overall, good skin care. Avoid using the antibacterial soaps. They say everybody needs to scrub with antibacterial soaps. Well, you know what? That strips your mantle, your, your first two dermis and, and your epidermis. You know, again, think of your skin is there to protect you. If you keep stripping it of what it needs, you're going to end up having problems with your skin. Um, avoid um, avoid the, the powders, okay? A lot of the powders out there... Uh, have like cornstarch in it, and that can actually promote yeast. Um, watch out putting excessive creams over bony areas since they soften the skin and they can promote some breakdown too. Make sure that your, your fingernails and toenails, you know, are, are cut and make sure they're, they're taken care of. Okay, so this look familiar? This is actually the drying the skin of too much of, a, of um, soaps, all right? And actually trying to scrub your skin clean. All right, so be careful when you do take a shower and you're, and you're uh, using a, a washcloth, make sure you're not rubbing so hard. All right, so this is a common problem from not keeping skin clean. This is actually folliculitis. This happens in a lot of males, okay, when they have a lot of thick hair around the pubis area, on the back of their thighs, in between their thighs. This is a common problem. All I can say is that you really need to just keep up with the hygiene. There are, uh, are, uh, are over-the-counter products called like a Hibiclens, uh, something that you can use to tie to take off that barrier, um, that uh, bacteria uh, around the hairline. Don't want to use it a lot, but if you start to break out, a couple of days of this will, will help with that. And also, any creams that have dimethicone in it, um, that seems to be the best thing out there on the market. The higher the dimethicone, the better it is for your skin. All right, so there's no pressure here, but watch out for your head, all right, when you're doing this. All right, so these are tried and true pressure relief, and I can't stress this enough. I mean, you guys all know this too, but you really have to reposition as much as you can. Um, the less, uh, and these are the less obvious techniques, but subtle movements count. They really do. And pa on people that we can't move in the hospital, just the subtlety of just changing their, their foot just a little bit or lifting their, their knee or their thigh or putting a pillow underneath it really does help. So subtle movements really count. All right, this is all about the pressure redis uh, redistribution support for the Medicare coverage um, criteria. 
This is an ongoing battle, I tell you right now. Um, it's ever changing, and uh, I don't, I, I can't predict what's going to come down the road. But um, all I know is that you know we're we're fighting to maintain stability right now for uh, pressure uh, redistribution supports because it's it's needed. And you know Medicare is hot about preventative stuff right now, and this is what we're pushing for. Okay, so um, all spinal cord injury patients are. Uh, eligible to get a group one pressure uh, redistribution support service, okay? And it's a foam overlay, all right? And they either come in that or they come in a gel. And they're about two inches thick, and they must be durable, waterproof, and they can be directly placed on a hospital bed. The problem that I found being out in the community, especially working recently, um, is that, you know, patients that have partners that are spinal cord injured, they want to have, um, still stay in the, in, the, in the queen size bed with them. So um, what happens is that, okay, well, we can get you a gel overlay, but you know what, that's just not right, you know? So what I've been trying to do is, is get them a larger bed, you know, like say a double for the bariatric, and it, it worked only one time, and that was because they had stage three, and the, the wife was the primary caregiver, but uh, we're trying to work on that too. And it's an on, still an ongoing battle. Okay, so the group one services there, uh, again, you all quali uh, the spinal cord injury patient qualifies it, and um, also for any uh, pressure ulcer on the trunk or pelvis. Was if you do have a stage, if you do have a pressure ulcer on the trunk or the pelvis, you should be in a group two. So that being said, here you go. So multiple stage two pressure ulcers, okay, located in the trunk or the pelvis. That's basically anything below the waist, okay. And I'll just you can read through this. Uh, this is all in in the handout. Um, so, and it's important for you to understand this because this is what you need. You need to have a surface that's going to support you and to allow you to turn easily and to keep that pressure off, okay? So speak to what is going on with your body saying, you know what, I have a new breakdown. My, my mattress is three years old, but yet I have a couple of stage twos now. I was sick and I need something else. So keep that in mind and if you need some help trying to find a resource or a vendor, call your primary care doctor. Maybe they'll, hopefully they'll hook you up with a VNA that has you know, a certified wound ostomy nurse that they can go out there or physical therapy to kind of readdress the situation with you, okay? Um, these, these group two support services, they usually uh, have an air pump or a blower, and they have inflated cells of which uh, is circulating at, at five inches or greater. And that's important because, again, you need that uh, pressure uh, redistribution to do that, all right? Uh, that's very important because, again, that helps you with just the subtleties of, of um, movement. Okay, and these particular surfaces are, are, are very are, are mostly designed to reduce the friction in the shear and can be placed directly on the hospital frame. So that's really important too. There's your wheelchair cushions. Always use a skin protective on um, uh, for a wheelchair cushion. Okay, um, they always need to be evaluated by a PT or an o, uh, OT. Um, the new cushions you can get every two to three years, depending on the cushion. If you have any new skin breakdown, you should. Uh, not only get a hold of um, uh, your, your physical therapy or if you're still involved in a rehab setting and to uh, make sure that they look at what's going on with your skin <coughs> and either do some uh, pr pressure mapping here, <coughs> which is the latest and greatest thing that's down the pike. Every time we go to conference, they have a new pressure mapping um, device, which is really great. And the National Pressure, the NP, AUAP is in the process of developing a standardized testing mythology because they want to make sure that you're not just, the, you know, uh, these mapping systems are accurate, okay? Because if they're not accurate, then you're going to run into trouble and you're going to be wasting money, all right? So that's really what's the latest and greatest on that. Um, so remember that the support, uh, support services are, uh, can only redistrib uh, redistribute the pressure. And there's a number of times where we would get overlays or group two mattresses in the hospital and uh, the patient doesn't think that they need to reposition, and that's not true. You really still need to try to, to reposition yourself off uh, the affected area. All right, now it's your turn. And what I did was I actually uh, got a question from um, Judy, and uh, she sent it to me just uh, by email. <coughs> and this is, um, this is a question that Mike had. He's a para. He's injured over 10 years ago. He was in an acute care hospital during the winter because of a, a respiratory, sorry, that's spelt wrong, respiratory infection. And while he was there, he developed a pressure also on his buttocks and on, and on one heel. He admits to not checking his skin while he was there, but expected the, ta uh, the staff would do so and thought he um, would have had the right kind of bed to prevent this. And he had not had a pressure ulcer in about eight years. 
Okay, so that's a great question. And his question, um, his question right here is rather, is uh, what do ac acute care hospitals have in place to help prevent this from happening? And will mentioning a sore in his medical records be enough of a red flag for future care? This is a great, great question. All right, and this is a hot, hot topic about uh, ac pressure ulcers acquired in, in hospitals. The, um, the issue with this question that I have is a little bit because I really don't know a lot about what Mike, how old he is, okay? So it was his injury back when he was 20 and now he's 30, which means his skin was probably in, in good uh, condition. He says that he hasn't had a pressure ulcer for over eight years, which shows you that he's been due diligent, has been taking care of himself, you know? Um, but, you know, that being said, where was his injury if he did uh, a, a pressure ulcer? Where were they? Were they, in fact, on his buttocks and on his heel? Okay, and, and I'm going to play a devil's advocate here is that, you know, sometimes when you have an acute situation, you get into the hospital, anything and everything could happen. He could have been in the unit. He could have been intubated. He could have been one of those respiratory people that he, could, he wasn't able to tolerate um, the bed being any, any lower than 45 degrees. Maybe he was intubated. Maybe he wasn't able to turn and he would desat, which means he would, you know, lose his oxygenization or he would, became hypotensive. There's numerous different things. Maybe he couldn't eat. All right, so those are the factors that, that interface um, sometimes that we have a problem with uh, trying to deal with uh, right before our very eyes the, the skin is deteriorating. So um, that being said, uh, what, with all this being said, the Center for Medicaid Services um, did make some changes back in 2008. And what they decided with that stage three and stage four pressure ulcers were added to the list of, of preventable hospital acquired conditions. Okay, and that means payment to these hospitals is denied if the condition develops, okay? So that's pretty big. That's huge, all right? Um, it's, it, it's been a hot topic with uh, just a huge situation with Boston Medical, and we've been all over this. Um, and that being said, the Agency of Healthcare Research and Quality is, uh, it's, it's actually, this particular uh, department is under the, uh, the U.S. Department of Human Service, and they help write the guidelines dealing with various health issues that threaten the U.S. population, and this was one of them. The stage threes and stage fours was a huge issue, uh, and this is what they do. They develop these guidelines, they implement them t for the interventions uh, for hospitals to use, and this right here that you're looking at right now is just the basic uh, pressure ulcer, uh, ulcer guidelines in most healthcare facilities. It's all patients, our skin is inspected daily, their positioning techniques, is, there's incontinence management, there are written turning schedules, um, nutrition evaluation, and teaching, most importantly, with the patient and the family, okay? So it's all about the skin that you're in. All right, so reporting systems for pressure ulcers at BMC is that uh, we have, if any skin breakdown uh, occurs after 24 hours of admission, <clears throat> Uh, and if within 24 hours it can be modified during the mission assessment. So this is huge. A lot of facilities are doing that because what they don't want is that they don't want this on their time, okay? They want to make sure that it didn't happen in, the, in their facility, all right? And it's, it's a really good tracking record for the Department of Public Health, too, to trace this, uh, these incidents, all right? Um, it's also to be, we have it to be completed within the hospital, uh, Acquired alteration skin integrity. This is all about how we document. All right, and um, all right. Let me go to the next one. Okay, we use a, a risk assessment tool like uh, most other facilities. We use the Braden scale. It's the most common, and it's really more than a number. It involves identifying the risk factors that contribute to the score and minimizing those specific deficits. Okay, so it's all about the sensory, the moisture, the mobility, the uh, nutrition, and the friction and shears. And the brain, a patient in our facility is considered at risk for skin breakdown with a brain scale less of 18, 18 or less, all right? So why is this so important? The stage three or four, again, is, a, is an acquired pressure ulcer, is considered a serious reportable event, a CRE. The DPH mandates in Massachusetts anyways that we report a CRE within seven days and conduct a root cause analysis within 30 days. This is all important for you guys to know, all right? And the root cause analysis is uh, so the, it's a confidential review. It's, it's a review within, um, within our hospital here, and it's, it's a, uh, coordinated by our risk management department. And, um, and the purpose is to identify problems and correct to prevent uh, future occurrences. So we're really being proactive with this, and that's what it's all about. It's all being proactive, being preventative, okay? Um, and again, this is because it's not reimbursable. This is our, uh, the Braden uh, scale is a risk, uh, like, this is what it looks like. 
And honestly, if you were a parrot, you would come in here, you would automatically fall between the 14s. You know, so we would um, more than likely, if you had a history of like incontinence or problems, we would already set up a, uh, definitely have a, a skin plan in place, but also you would most likely um, probably have a group two bed, I'm thinking. That's what I'm thinking. And this is, goes on about the mobility, the nutrition, and it's just a scoring, okay? Uh, so what we're trying to do at Boston Medical is kind of not look at this so much, but also look at the comorbidities. If, uh, you know, John Doe came in and he was a para, but yet he was a diabetic, he had other issues going on, then we would look at all of those things also, too, to kind of formulate a plan in place. All right, so let me just talk about wound care products for a minute. And that's it. <laughs> no, I mean, really, just a minute, because uh, there is just so much. I could do another lecture on wound care products alone. This is a picture. I love this picture because, honestly, I stepped into a, one of a patient's uh, home about a year and a half ago, and I went into their back closet, and this is what I found. I found a bazillion types of products. I was like, whoa, did I step into a, you know, a DME? And, and uh, he was like, he told me, like, well, I need this for that. I need this for that. And, you know, and uh, this used to work, and now it's not. And, you know, I'm just keeping it all just in case. So the point I'm trying to make is that, you know, not every product is for every type of wound. And, you know, as seen on TV doesn't mean it works for you, okay? So what you really need to do is, is there's so many choices, but there's really so little time for all of this. But, I mean, what I'm trying to get to you is that, you know, you need to have um, a member of a healthcare, or a professional healthcare person look at this. All right, I really encourage you to, if you find something and you don't know what it is, now, mind you, if you've, you've had products like I need to put, like say a hydrocolloid on my hip that really helped or a foam that would really help. But if it's not if it's not doing anything and it's getting worse, then you really need to have somebody look at it. Someone that can really study it, see what's going on with you, how are you sitting, what's going on with your nutrition. Um, is there anything else that we could possibly kind of put together to find out why this is happening? So really don't rely on the products and the gimmicks out there and there's no really magic remedy. Honestly, the, don't get hooked on products, all right? You know, nine times out of ten when I go in and I see a patient, and the first thing I ask is, how long are you spending in the wheelchair? Well, I've been in the wheelchair like, you know, 10 or 12 hours a day, and that actually has been increasing. And so you say, well, when do you have time to get off of that? Well, I don't really. You know, so there you go. You know, so it may be just something simple, and it's usually something simple is the fact that they have to offload it. Okay? So. Um, just some other things about products. These are great products right here. I like the one, I'm too sexy for my wheels. I think that's a great product. <laughs> Look at that little wheelchair thing. So that's, um, I thought it was great. So um, listen, you don't have to go there alone, really, you don't. There is a lot of research. Bethany uh, was concerned about that, I'm sure, with her calls that she was making. But there are resources out there. I mean, if you just peruse, if you're all um, computer savvy, there's a lot of stuff out there uh, regarding uh, spinal cord injury patients for every topic you can possibly imagine. I was really impressed with all the things that I found, all the good things that I found. Um, one of them, again, there in the back of the research, uh, the back of the handouts will be uh, some websites for not only the Medicare, the reimbursement for all your support services, but also um, some resources for clothing. Some great, great stuff out there. Okay, so um, that is available to you, and you can also contact us here. And okay, and that's really a wrap. And uh, any questions? Yeah. Now that you're all asleep, we can wait. You could. I'll just wait for, there's two of us coming around with microphones before you ask your questions, so I'll just start right here. Uh, could you go back to the cushion, mm -hmm. to the screen where the cushions are? The screen with the cushions, okay. What can I help you with that? Yeah, uh, no, go back, right? Mm -hmm. Nope, no other one. No, go back a the, little bit. Oh. It was like... No, you passed. The one with the bed? Yeah, right there. Okay. The, the third question right there, where can you get that? The This one right here? With all the bubble. The, bubble the Rojo thing. cushion? Yeah, where can you get that? Well, why why do you ask where, where can you, do because you need? I, I use a, a manual wheelchair as well, and I use the, but I use the gel one. Okay. But I, I, I sat on that one. My, my friend had one like that, and it felt a lot better. Okay. So it, how's your skin, okay? My skin is fine. But so, that, again, if you, if you have a, a gel cushion, you know, and it's been a couple of years, you can get yourself a Rojo cushion. 
you know, you just have to go back and have be evaluated by a PT or OT, and you have to have a written uh, medical necessity by your doctor. And there's a bunch of DME companies out there too that will come out there and fit you for it. So um, that's a good question, you know. And I, I really encourage you, um, everyone that's in the wheelchair, to really uh, look into getting your uh, wheelchair cushion every two to three years. Uh, and I also please don't be um, kind of micking it either too. If you're having a problem with the wheelchair cushion, don't be you know sliding pillows and things underneath there because those can actually cause more problems down the road. Yes. Okay, this one's better. I seem to be having a chronic problem where it's been for months, uh, where my left ischial tuberosity is very painful most of the time, and it definitely gets better when I offload, mm -hmm. but there is absolutely no visible skin breakdown or skin changes. Uh, I check it regularly, and it's always you know just the same as the rest of my skin. Okay. And I don't seem to be able to get a lot of attention from my medical doctors or uh, my DME provider because uh, the doctors are saying, well, if there's no skin breakdown, there's not much we can do to diagnose it. Uh, and the DME provider, I've been trying to get a cushion that works for me for almost since I've been discharged from rehab a year ago, and it's been a very painful process so far. So how long, do you, how long have you had your wheelchair cushion? Uh, about a year. I've been less than a year past injury. Now, did you tell me you did gain weight, or did you not? I have gained some weight. How much? Uh, probably somewhere between 20 and 30 pounds. Okay, so you need to be reevaluated. Okay, okay. That, that in itself is enough for you to get a different type of wheelchair cushion. And, right. you know, and people with spinal cord uh, injuries, they, you know, with bed sores, they can develop the, the, that autotomic uh, dysreflexia, too. And that can be just subtle symptoms as, um, you know, goosebumps or uh, bread blotchy skin, headaches, dizziness, you know. And so that pressure alone may be causing you to be symptomatic with, a, with that type of pain. So um, you need to have that reevaluation. You need to tell me you've gained some weight. Okay. And you're having those symptoms. Okay, basically that's the sore and it's... Yes. Okay, because yes. like I said, it just it doesn't show anything. Which Mobility is... issues are, are in wheelchair cushions and support service are based on height and weight and changes in skin. So you definitely qualify for that. Okay. Um, and you need it too. Right. And is there anything I find that, I know you were saying people who stop sweating below their level of injury. I find that I sweat uh, quite profusely um, where a lot of times if I'm on a cushion that's not real porous, uh, I stick my hand between my seat and my cushion, and it's basically almost wet. Mm -hmm. uh, it's common, too. You know, okay. And I think you need to have, because of the weight issue, too, that you need to have a special type of uh, a fluctuating air cushion that allows for that escape of um, the air you know, from that site. So there's a lot of different cushions out there. And I strongly recommend that you be mapped, pressure mapped. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? We have a question from the webcast, and the first question is, I am a quad, I have a tilt chair, and a Rojo cushion. What's the latest cushion technology you guys see and or recommend? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, sight unseen, again, I, I asked questions about how tall he was. Um, you know, I know he has a tilt. Has he gained any weight? Um, really, the latest and greatest thing out there for people that are in wheelchairs is to be pressure mapped. Um, that tilt may not be tilting back enough and it may be causing some other issues. Uh, so I, again, would um, defer to uh, wherever you are for a rehab setting or for wherever you have your DME company uh, to be pressure mapped. Anyone else? Yes. Nope. Oh, over there. Whoops. I 
to it. Yeah. I, I was wondering if there's a difference in color for a black skin with reference to ulcers. For, for pressure, yes there is. And, um, there is, it, it, it's a discoloration and it's usually a darkened hue, all right? And I uh, went over that by accident there, but yeah, that it, it's darkened in hue. So if you have the star of a pressure ulcer, it would be almost like a, a really deeper color and it may be almost like a purplish color, okay? So if you're starting to get a purplish color and you try to press on it, and if it changes color, after 30 minutes you're all set. If it doesn't, then you need to really focus on offloading that. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Especially, well, I know I, I wouldn't be able to tell if my skin, if, if the spot is reddish in a, in a dark skin. So <laughs> <We're>, <laughs> I was trying to find out how, how do I differentiate reddish, <laughs> except when it's bleeding. Oh, wait, okay, wait, so you don't know if it's, if, are you saying that you just can't, you can't use a mirror and you can't see it, or? I can't see the color red. You can't, are you, you I can't, can't see, see the, the color, color red. Okay, are you feeling any pain at all, like anything that you would uh, notice any differential of that, or headaches, dizziness? I don't have the problem right now, but I'm just oh, okay. envisioning. <laughs> you know, yeah. now, okay. okay, all right. So you know what, if you're finding that something looks stra different on your body, you know, ask someone else to look at it, you know, and, uh, or go to your doctors or, or your, your primary care or someone, you know, to have someone else take a look at that. It, that's a tough one, because if you can't see it, how do you know, you're right. And you have to rely on a caregiver to really be good at, at skin inspection, which is another issue too, because that's a lot of teaching that has to be done with them. Yes. Yeah, hi. Hi. Um, I don't speak that much English, but um, I have a husband, and he's in a nursery home. He got a bru a bruise right, right in, be in the back, and it's pretty big. It, it's, I don't know if it's gonna get, if it's gonna heal or what, can you explain to me? Okay, so you, he has it on his backside? Yeah, this is how big it is. And it's, is it is a dark color? It's real big. You want to see it? It's real big? Okay, sure. I mean, um, is it on his sacrum area or? It's right in the bottom. Whoa. Is that open right now? Yeah, it is. It is. And, and my making content is um, they only clean that once a day, like every morning. That's my main content. And I believe the syphilis, it got a lot of bacteria. Uh -huh. And that's close to where I hit to his pool. Okay. And they only clean him once a day, that's it. Okay. And he's, he puked like three times a day. Mm hmm and that, okay, so what she's saying is that he's got, he's, it's very significant, it's about this big, and it's open, okay, and it's right near his, um, his looks like his lower buttocks, so uh, night, right near his rectum, and what she's saying is that he's in a nursing home where they only clean him once a day, or they change the dressing once a day, is what I think she's saying, and uh, where he does have a lot of stools more frequently. So... That's something that you would, as if he's in this facility, you need to talk to a supervisor about, okay? Because dressings need to be changed if they're soiled, okay? And if the drainage warrants it, all right? I had talked to them, but it's like they don't want to listen. So are you there frequently enough that you could do it, or? I'm every day, every day, every day for him there. For the I guess then if they're not listening to you, you need to take it to someone up higher, to someone that will pay attention to you and then to offer to you to say, then give me the dressings and I'll change it myself. And is the doctor, when is the doctor coming to take a look at this? Is, can he go see another doctor, you know? No, no, no. Right now he's there and, you know, I'm waiting to the give me, um, because I have a voucher for Session A, I'm waiting to the give me, um, um, to be from apartment for I can take him out of there. I because see. Because I will take care of him very I well. See. I see. 
I, that, that's a tough one. And unfortunately, you know, we talked about guidelines that everybody has, and though it's written someplace in probably somebody's policy book and procedure or guidelines, it doesn't mean it's always implemented. And for that, I feel sorry for you about, you know what I mean? And all I can say is that whatever you can do for him, but as soon as it gets out there, make sure you get a V&A in place that has all of your resources available to you. I, I start having people who help me today, like her, like Anna, they, they're gonna help me. Right, yeah. and make sure that he's I, repositioned too. I told her about my concern about the brew, and she told me he's supposed to be changed at least clean twice a day. He should be changed more often than that. Yeah, and more only do it one time a day. I'm sorry, I, I don't know. All I can say is that you have to advocate you as his wife, say go to as far as you can. And either that or I'll say, okay, then give me everything I need to clean him up. Or actually report him to the Department of Public Health if you feel as though he's not really getting taken care of. Accreditation, Accreditation agency, you can do anything. I mean, you're, you're a consumer, you're a, you're a caregiver, you know? So. If you can get a social worker to help you to do that, maybe that might help too. Social worker they have in that nursery home, he's not helping me either. He's not helping. He's not. Maybe because my English is not the best English, or what it is. Yeah, but your rights are your rights, and you know what, and you need to, you probably need to call a Department of Public Health if you really feel as though this isn't working for you. And get an interpreter to help you do that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Well, I have two more quick questions. Um, one is, this is from Webcasters, what do you recommend as the best sun protection product? Really? Uh, <laughs> hmm. Well, let's see. Uh, what do I use? Um, you, you need to have, uh, you know, a high, uh, yeah, SPF. Um, there are some, some people have a problem with the zinc in it. And so the less, there are, are non, uh, there are hypoallergenic um, SPFs out there. Uh, Neutrogena is one of them, uh, which is a really good product. There's also some very high and expensive ones too. Uh, but over the counter, actually the best one that, that I think is great, that's hypoallergenic is called the NOAD, the NOAD ones. And that's very inexpensive. But the idea is that you have to reapply. And that's um, and even though this is waterproof and sweatproof and everything else, you still have to reapply. I don't know any product out there that says like, oh, you never have to reapply. And that goes with any type of skin product too, berry creams, and whatnot. And um, also, what was the ingredient you said should be present in creams? Demi something? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I knew that was uh, going to be asked. It's dimethicone. Dimethicone. Dimethicone, and there are some really good, it's funny because the dimethicone now seems to be the added ingredient in a lot of the high-end barrier creams, which are used to be able to get over the counter, and now they're considered like a part of a wound care treatment program for, for healing of stage two and for management of incontinence dermatitis, which I didn't have a picture of that, but that's another problem too. But uh, so the dimethicone, and there are, uh, there's uh, some great, uh, there's coloplast out there, which is a, a, a great um, product has a high uh, dimethicone usage, and there's also Medline that has um, some, some products too. All these are accessible over on the website uh, on if you Google them. You can actually get some pre-samples. Yes. You had mentioned that hospitals are not paid if a stage three or stage four wound Correct. develops. Are nursing homes held as accountable? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. E okay. Even more so. Um, there's there's a lot more going on with them than there is with the hospitals. It's a very, very importantly, it, and it really, and if it was acquired at, at that nursing home, they're losing. They're, they will not be able to regain any of those costs to take care of it for any advanced wound care treatment. So if he has to go to surgery, but that would be outside of the nursing home anyway. So. It's, it's really, that's, that's hard, I, really. I'm sorry, did you have? This. My question is, for people that don't use wheelchairs regularly, maybe they 
um, interchange between wheelchairs and crutches, do they still have to um, pay attention to the type of um, cushion that's supposed to be used? They should, yes. Yes, okay. um, immobility is immobility. So if you're in the chair and you're sitting for long periods of time and you're unable to you know, totally offload, you do need to pay attention to that. Okay. Absolutely, without a doubt. All right, thank you. There's another question down there. How do you get off of this slide? Sorry, down the one mic. Sorry about that. That's okay. Hmm? Lately, um, Medi Medicare or Medicaid or Mass Health denies modern wheelchairs that have elevations or stand aid uh, uh, adaptabilities. What can we do to be able to um, be able to write up a prescription or a support to be able to get Medicare to approve such standing wheelchairs? Medicaid. Or standing Did you say Medicaid? Medicaid or Mass Health. Me it, it won't happen. It just won't happen. You, you, you can get a, uh, you know, Medicare will pay 80% and then they, they'll, you'll have to pay the 20% out of pocket. And the reason being is that it, it's not a medical need and necessity to have a motorized wheelchair if you're able to use a regular wheelchair. But if you're not using a regular wheelchair, but you're using a mobilized wheelchair and be able to enhance your skill management, your skills management, can you recommend a wheelchair that has a, st a stand aid capability? What type of a, a, mobilized, uh, a mobilized wheelchair that will be covered? Yes, you know, okay. like a Promobile does have a stand aid wheelchair. A oh, standing one? I'm sorry, yeah. I didn't hear that. A standing one? <laughs> <laughs> That's really, really. You, that's a tough one, and you, like you would have to go to a seating clinic to see, if, uh, and, and they would have to write it an extensive medical need and necessity for that. Well, my interest is that students of present days, either physical therapy or occupational therapy, need to um, um, elevate the way they write up the evaluations for Medicaid or Marcel to evaluate right. uh, the purchase of such wheelchairs. Right. And I'm, I'm trying to have a feel how to influence that in schools where people are being taught how to write up such How to write it up? You want to know how to write it up? Yes, because it depends on how you write it up, I think. Oh, it absolutely does. But um, I can't, you know, give you a dialogue in that without knowing all the other stuff that's going on with you, you know, to, or if it's not you, for somebody else, you know, because um, it is, is it's quite a script that you have to, really make sure you have all of the, your I's dotted and your T's crossed with it. You know, it's, it's hard, you know, it's just, it's just one of those things that we're trying to, you know, they're, they're, they're screaming of, of, of preventability here and, you know, we're trying to really be proactive of that, but it seems like we're, we come across a lot of stumbling blocks. And that being one of them is just like, oh, it's not written the right way, you know. So, uh, but I would sit down with, if, you know, with your occupational therapist or your physical therapist and really explain to them, you know, so they can translate it in medical terms that they would understand better. And also be able to get something through, Ma through Mass Rehab. Mass Rehab is a very good resource, yep. They, they, they'll look at it as saying you're doing something that would influence your employability. Right. Right, and that's a very good point too. Uh, the Mass Rehab Association are what is wonderful with that, and they're on, uh, really up on, on a lot of things, uh, more so on the forefront of most, of, of most mobility issues and for how many hours that you'll be allocated for a PCA and all that good stuff. Anyone else? Can't you go through a disability advocate for that also? You can, you can go through that. Um, but I think he's looking for actually, thank you guys. Um, I think they're looking for, he, what he's looking for is someone to really write it out for him. You know, they would uh, do something like in, that. But uh, unless they're a physical therapist or an occupational therapist, they can go with him as a guide. Okay. You know, so that's but part of the issue. You also said something, my, my son, when he first got injured, he's a C6, C7, uh, Asia complete. He refused to go into a, motorized chair and are you saying that now that he's in a, 
uh, manual chair he wouldn't be able to get? No, he would be. Oh, okay. Absolutely. Okay. That doesn't change at all. You know, his, what, what he's, um, his allowable will never change. You know, and that's why I just say, you know, just keep up on it. You know, just get what you can get, you know. And, but also understand, too, that, you know, every time that you go and, and try to get something better when you really don't need it or you're not doing something right, it's just going to put you, set you back. So you really need to be looked at carefully. Yes. In a nursing home, does the management not owe the persons in the nursing home a duty of care? In regards to what the lady said, because I think this is a very critical issue for someone in a nursing home because it looks like it's um, um, as a result of lack of care. Right. So uh, is there no um, body or that she could um, call upon to report the issue? The minute you call the Department of Public Health, mm -hmm. They're there within a day. Okay. They really are, uh, with any type of complaint that you have. But she has to address the um, issue with the management first, right? Nope. No, so she could just go ahead? If she's, if she's headed up to here, mm -hmm. you know, then, and she hasn't gone anywhere, I mean, regardless, she, she should just call the Department of Public Health. I mean, it's, uh, she, I think she's at that point. Thank you. No, thank you. Anyone else? Is that it, Judy, for questions? Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. My pleasure.